All right. We're here today um, with a beautiful friend of mine. Some of you may know if you've watched some commercials down in Los Angeles, and I assume nationally a few. And if you've seen some versions of little things that she's been on on te television, she's an actress, but that's not why she's being interviewed. And she's an activist in the mystical spiritual world. Yeah, that's why we're going to talk to her because she's very involved in that. She's not only formally studied it with a doctorate and masters and all those things, but she's also been intimately involved with the spiritual welfare of others, not just herself. And that's that kind of outreach is what impresses me because she's working on herself at the same time she's spreading the ripples of her love nationwide and probably worldwide because uh, she's that kind of person. She's got a worldwide smile, big heart, personal friend of mine. We shared a spiritual mentor many years ago. And uh, first time I met her, uh, and I don't know if I told you this, Diane, Diane Hudock, by the way, in case for those people wondering who was talking to, uh, first time I met her, uh, you were going to introduce this this uh, this guru that we were working with at the time, and and you asked me for advice, and I thought, well, that's strange. She's an actress. She knows this. She knows that. She, she knows more than I do. What she asked me, but you took this old man and said, okay, what do you got to offer? And I thought, okay, she's just being nice. And in 15, 20 minutes of conversation, when you end up doing your program that night, every piece of advice I gave you was better than I gave it to you. It was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, it was like, I, I was impressed. And uh, I thought, what a quick study. Wow. And the reason, the reason it worked out so well is in your delivery, you came across as honest, sincere, and it was all from the heart. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna let people read below all the accomplishments and things you've done. There's one thing I'm still waiting for you to do, Diane. Oh, what's that? I'm, I'm waiting for your autobiography to come out, of course. Okay, tall order. <laughs> now, you and I have talked a few times over the years, and I don't think we've really talked about dysfunctional families too much. Yeah. But from everybody that I've talked to in the spiritual world, yeah, and every book I've read from St. Francis to whoever, that seems to be a prerequisite. If you come from a dysfunctional family, you got a chance to be either a saint or in yeah. jail, one of the two in the nut house, right? Yeah. But there's a pathway that opens up that takes that kind of childhood. Yeah. So I, I'm just assuming that you're a normal spiritual person that there probably was some things in your life, but uh, what got you started? How'd you get your first, your first uh, feet on the ground on this? Where'd you start? Well that is a great introductory question and thank you for all your beautiful words um in the beginning there um that means so much to me <laughs> so yeah i think just like you bill our challenges particularly in childhood not only do they shape us but to me like you my childhood was very traumatic. Um, I grew up uh, in a home that was both loving and violent, physically violent, emotionally violent. Um, I won't say who, but there was an individual in my family that really had it out for me. And um, I don't talk about, I've never really talked about this. This is the first time I've ever talked about this in public, but there's no time like the present. And I do this in service to your question and in service to anyone that's listening to this, that these things that happen to us, these um, challenges, be it a challenging upbringing, for me, it was like an initiation and when you grow up with that kind of environment that's not safe or it's safe one minute and you don't know what's coming around the corner the next minute, you inherently start to develop not just this sixth sense that I believe we all have, 
but we start to turn on, or at least I did, I started to turn on this inherent signaling system where I started tapping into, for my own survival, mind you, these unseen forces. And you could call that prayer, you could call that meditation, you could call that even spiritual experimentation because I was a child. And meanwhile, there's loving in the household, but also there's a lot of mental illness and violence that is mixed with that. And so um, I had to find ways to rise above the, um, the curr curriculum that was being given to me. And spirituality was this uh, thing that was sort of in my, it was in the ether. It was, the, the upbringing was the very vehicle that initiated me into going into this um, inner archeological dig trusting that there is more than what meets the eye. Yes, these things are happening to me, but there's, there's gotta be a way where not only I can find a way to survive, but I can also um, empower myself and find ways to make my life um, filled with the loving that I seek. So, that was my upbringing. And I, um, I always felt a presence around me. And I started seeing angels when I um, was very young. Let's talk uh, about that. Let's, let's, yeah. Let's, let's go there. That's not a normal thing. Right. But in the world that you and I come from, and some of the people we know, they've had similar experiences. So it is kind of, yeah. in our world, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a normal thing. It's but a normal thing. You know, it's, it's what? What are you talking about? Well, I should say it's a normal thing, but in my humanness, with all these spiritual experiences I've had, mystical experiences, supernatural, not of the natural earthly realm stuff, in my humanness, my basic humanness, I've had these crazy experiences, but I still have doubt. So the humor still sits <laughs> where I'll have this experience and then I'll just go about my day and it's like, okay, that happened. And uh, to answer your question, um, yes, my, my first experience that I recall, um, I was about seven years old and I was in the back seat of my mom's car. We were driving around or coming from the supermarket and wherever we were. And back then, as you know, seat belts, seat belts were like, um, <laughs> like a decorative accessory. <laughs> they were optional. And I wasn't wearing my seat belt. And for some reason, um, I was a very, you know, uppity, physical, I was a, gym, a kid. I did a lot of gymnastics. I loved to dance. I didn't sit still much. And so I was bouncing around in the back seat of the car and we're going around the corner in this big Lincoln Continental, which is kind of like a boat. And the door on the right side swings open and I fall, I'm on my stomach on the seat and my head is, my torso is dangling out of the car as my mother is going around the corner and I'm about one inch from the asphalt and my mother's going about 40, 45 miles per hour. And I was about to fall out of the car, no question. And all of a sudden, I felt and saw this sort of swooping in of light and hands, but they weren't like hands we see here in the physical. Again, hard to find words in English to describe it, but it was like they were hands that were just so massive and filled with light. They picked me up and catapulted me, literally threw me 
from hanging out all the way to the other door and I hit my head hard in the back uh, on the window and that right door closed shut. And my mother didn't know what was going on. She just heard a bang and she said, is everything okay, dear? You know, everything okay back there? And I'm like, yeah, mom. Now my mom doesn't even know that story. Um, but that was very, um, I wouldn't say it didn't happen all the time, but that happened um, once in a while and more than not. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, that too shaped me knowing that there are these unseen forces. I don't understand it. I'm a kid, but I know I can somehow rely on it. Doesn't mean that I'm gonna be stupid, but somehow I can rely on it when I'm uh, in, when I'm in need. So, yeah. So you might have had your uh, own little experience with your own personal guardian angel. I think so. I think so. And um, growing up, I, I feel like this guardian angel was around me many times where I should have been dead. I should have drowned. This person would take me out to go um, uh, swimming and, and we would grow up going to the beach in Rhode Island to this cove and there was a sandbar. It was notorious for this sandbar that would just drop off and it would go from being about three feet of water at low tide where we get quahogs, we go digging for quahogs. And that was a thing we did, we'd swing around the horseshoes, you know, do crazy things like kids do. And this person was like, let's go out here and, and I'll, I'll take, you, take you out here. And then took me to the edge of the sandbar and pushed me out into the sea where it drops about 50 feet and the current is insane. And I felt myself just going out to sea and I heard a voice that said, don't worry, we'll carry you. And then all of a sudden, somehow, some way, it was like the sandbar came to me. I was out about, I don't know, 20 feet out in the middle of the ocean. And this person realized, oh, yikes, I think, uh, I think I, I think I did it this time. And uh, then realized, I think in their terror that they may have gotten away with, gotten away with it. And then all of a sudden I got thrown back to the sandbar about, it was the longest 60 minutes of my life. <laughs> uh, 60 seconds, excuse me, 60 minutes. That would have been really intense, but longest 60 seconds of my life. And um, so that was sort of this, underbelly that was always in the periphery um, as I was growing up. And then when I um, got to college, I got sick and I was so excited to get out of the house. You know, college was like this great respite from the environment that I grew up in. And uh, I started getting sick and uh, I went to the doctor to this university, a prestigious university, and they said, oh, you have an aggressive form of lupus. And they said, oh, you might have a year to, you know, they're just kind of like, oh, you might have a year to live. You might have two, we'll see. And they're saying this to an 18 year old girl. And I'm kind of trying to digest all this information. And my mom's outside in the hallway and I've got about, similar to your story, Bill, as a child in the hospital, I, you, you feel like you're the specimen and you've got all these doctors and doctor uh, uh, pre-med students and um, checking out your hair, looking at you, feeling your skin. And it's like, you're just this walking specimen. And, um, I decided that I was not gonna accept that diagnosis and I was going to heal myself. And I decided to go become pre-med. I was going to be a doctor. I would spend hours in the Georgetown library 
um, studying autoimmune disease, trying to figure out, you know, as an 18 year old girl, medical literature. And of course I got about 50% of it and some of it, um, I would just go down the rabbit hole and it'd take me to another uh, study, to another study. And then I started, of course, as people do, um, you start looking alternatively. So I started looking at healers. I started looking at way back then frequency. I started looking at herbs. I started looking at prayer. I started looking at how we can rewire the brain from trauma. This is me at 18. And then I'm in school and I'm looking at my next semester's uh, schedule for my pre-med studies. And it's <laughs> chemistry, chemistry, biology, biology, chemistry, chemistry two, chemistry. Uh, and I had a breakdown and I was like, I can't do this. I hate chemistry. I got a D in chemistry in high school. <laughs> and I, I can't do this. And I was um, acting a little bit in college and I would always remember this incredible feeling that many actors talk about the first time they're on stage or the first time they make a people or an audience laugh. That feeling of having um, the audience in, in the palm of your hand through the power of your portrayal, through the power of your emotions, through the power of your storytelling. And that was where my heart was. So I quit pre-med. I applied to acting school in London. I ended up getting into RADA and BADA, which was the British American Drama Academy. And I spent about a year and a half there and that changed the trajectory of my life. Now, what's really interesting and why I'm sharing this story is because I think there is a really important spiritual component. When I was in school in London, um, I went to the top lupus special who's now passed now. He was in his 70s, 20 something years ago. And he's looking at my chart. He's looking at my blood um, results. He's looking at everything. And he's just quiet for a while. And I'm walking with this, I don't know when I'm gonna die, so let's live in the moment thing. And he leans in and he says, you don't have lupus. <laughs> and I said, what? That's gotta be a mistake. You've gotta look again. Because in my mind, I had seated in my consciousness that I was going soon. And um, this story to me is so um, interesting. And, and I think that it's poignant for several reasons. One is the power that we give authority, the power that we give others, even people in white coats, right? Or robes. <laughs> or suits to tell us who we are, how we should feel, what's gonna happen to predict the future. And I had a hard time when he told me, you don't have lupus. I had to really scrub the past seeding from my brain, from my field. And what's even more astonishing is that when you looked at my blood results, my ANAs and my antibodies were in the thousands, way out there, like really bad, like the body was attacking itself before. But when I went to London, I was away from my family. I was in an amazing foreign country. I was experiencing things that I'd never experienced before that were so expansive. I fell in love and was in love for the first time. And I was doing what I loved every single day. 
And I believe that I healed myself through the sheer power, the potency of my joy. And that's spirituality to me, to be immersed in your joy. And it can look different for all kinds of people. Acting can be a moving meditation if you want it to be that. Chanting can be a moving meditation. Swimming can be a moving meditation. Meditation can look like a lot of different things. And sometimes, yes, it's important to be still. I would be an advocate of that <laughs> for obvious reasons. But there are many ways to express and experience the um, divinity and the power of our divinity to heal um, through our joy. So that you ask me how I got into spirituality. It started with my upbringing as a sort of initiation, I believe. And then when I got sick, you know, I see illness as the cure because it's the illness that is the medium from which I sought deeper meaning, deeper healing, and my own um, liberation from my misinterpretations of myself based on the past through using acting as a way to clear the misunderstandings, to clear the limited interpretations of myself and to um, kind of gestalt with myself all those disintegrated parts that needed healing. So to me, it's all spiritual. Spirituality doesn't have to look like this. Um, it, spirituality doesn't even mean you have, doesn't mean you have to go sit in a temple. doesn't mean you have to get prayer beads. It's what works for you. It's very individualized. It's very personalized. And if it opens your heart and it expands you into that loving nature that is the God of your understanding, then have at it. To me, you're winning. So at that formative age, then, let's take you back to your college days and act, acting, you know, learning that in England. What was your religious background? Was there books or mentors or people or movements or groups in your life that were helping you to formulate your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I grew up uh, Catholic and um, I grew up, my father was uh, half, he was Czechoslovakian. I'm half Czechoslovakian. My mother is Irish, American Irish. And so my heritage is half Irish and half Czechoslovakian. Now, if we look at that in religion, religion uh, terminology, my father was Eastern Rite Catholic and my mother was Roman Rite Catholic. So <laughs> growing up, um, so that my parents would get along, I guess. Uh, one Sunday, I'd be at Sunday school with my Eastern Rite Catholic Church. And the next Sunday, I'd be at the Roman Rite Catholic Church. And I personally found it all incredibly boring. And the Eastern Rite Catholic Church had an amazing nut roll. So I would just pretend during my Sunday school that I had to go to the bathroom and I had a stomach ache and I would work it to just go spend my time in the basement eating the nut roll and slowly weaving my way back to the last 10, 15 minutes of Sunday school. So religion um, didn't have much gravity for me in shaping my spirituality. Um, but I remember my first experience was uh, I, I had these experiences that I spoke of with these angels, these, this presence growing up. But my first experience with a spiritual teacher was actually when I was about 21. And I had moved to New York City after uh, college. And when you're an actor, you have to get headshots, right? And so you can audition and you, they, 
do it maybe a little bit differently now because everything's online, but you'd go to an audition, you hand them your physical headshot, yada, yada. So I was sent to this photographer and um, he was going to do my headshot. And when I went to his apartment, it was like going back in time to like an Indian shrine in the middle of the Big Apple. You'd go downstairs into his apartment. It was like a, under uh, one of those that go uh, from street level, you'd walk downstairs. And it was like this cave of devotion to these spiritual masters of India. And he had a spiritual teacher or guru. I don't remember her name. She's in upstate New York. I want to say Guru Ma, but I'm, I'm not, don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. Um, but he was always playing uh, this kirtan in the background. I didn't even know what kirtan was. I just know it felt really good when I go over to this guy's place and he'd start, after we did the photos, we became friends and he kind of took me under his wing and showed me all these things about the, uh, he gave me books to read, um, autobiography of a yogi, of course, <laughs> it always comes back. And he took me up to upstate New York to this ashram. And uh, I received my first darshan. And I remember I was in line walking up to this woman. And as I got closer and closer, I started having this experience <laughs> where I felt my body expanding to the size of the ceiling, like a Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade, uh, you know, like bunny, right? Like a blow up uh, uh, float. And I was all of a sudden 50 feet tall. My head was touching the ceiling. I could touch every edge of this building that was massive. And my heart was wide open and I was sobbing. I was uncontrollably sobbing. And for the first time, not knowing what this was, I was a little embarrassed. And I felt like I was in a room with probably really seasoned <laughs> experiencers of this thing we call darshan. And this was my first time. And I thought I was just gonna be nice, she's gonna wave a feather. She's gonna maybe put something, some oil on my head. It's all nice. And um, check, <laughs> you know, no, it was not what I expected. And it was beyond anything I could have whipped up in my imagination. And that really kicked the door wide open. And I realize now, uh, many years later, that um, at least for myself, all my mystical experiences, they're never, they're never planned. They're, they're never what I expect them to be. Um, they're not even necessarily, most of the time, in some place that's a sacred site or a temple. And they're in random places, like when I'm teaching yoga at the, at the gym and I'm in the basketball court and I'm got 50 people in Shavasana and I would just do this thing where I would walk around when people are lying in Shavasana, I just put my two fingers on their heart, just like a, my way of just giving them a connection to their heart. And um, I had this experience there where I went to this woman in Shavasana and Shavasana is about five minutes at the end of a yoga class, put my hand on her heart. And all of a sudden the Virgin Mary, the sacred mother, the divine mother, the Virgin of Guadalupe, whatever you want to call it, I don't care, took up just like I did in that ashram when I received darshan, the entire height of the ceiling of this basketball court. She was massive. She was filled with light. 
She was filled with love and she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen up until that point. And I've never had that experience before. Not like that. So I went to the woman after the yoga class and I said, you know, I just wanted to share with you. I've never had this happen to me before, but I don't know if you're going through something. I don't know if you're um, praying for someone because I wasn't praying to the Virgin Mary. <laughs> um, but I, I want you to know that when I touched your heart, the, what I assumed it was to be, the beloved mother, the Virgin Mary appeared to me. And I believe that she showed up for me to tell you that whatever you're going through, she's going to help you. And I truly believe that. Well, she broke down. She broke down. She's going, thank you so much. And she starts taking her necklace out and it's of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Then she takes her sweatshirt off. And when I'm teaching yoga, I don't really pay attention to what people are wearing. I'm just looking at bodies. And she's wearing a big t-shirt of the Divine Mother. And she says, she's my saint. My son is very sick. And I've been praying to her to heal my son. Thank you. And I said, well, I truly believe, and I believed it, that she's going to help you. Your son will be well. And I'm going to hold that in my heart for you. And then we went on our way. And then about three weeks later, I hadn't seen her. She came back to my yoga class and she was just waiting outside like by the stationary bikes. And she said, excuse me, I just wanna thank you. And I completely forgot about the experience. And she reminded me of it. And then I said, oh yes, how's your son? And he, she said, he's healed, he's well. And, oh, like it just makes me cry just thinking about it right now. And it was just one of those things that the humor of the divine is so relevant to me in my life. It was in the Spectrum Sports Center next to the E building, teaching a yoga class in the basketball court. Come on, <laughs> you know? I didn't call in the divine mother, but that's the power. That's the power that I think these beings possess and we too can look at that and hopefully it can bring us some comfort at least it does for me i'm not in the convincing business i'm in the inspiration business and to me it brings comfort knowing that my words somewhere in the ether are heard and they land and they're received so just like negativity travels in the field positivity travels in the field too energy is energy Spirit is spirit. And we can't be any more spiritual than we are right now. Like we're inherently that. So to even say we're spiritual is kind of like an oxymoron <laughs> because it's just who we are. We're Hugh men, which some people listening to this may not know. Hugh is an ancient name for God. So we're both God and earthly beings. In spiritual psychology, we rest on a very important foundational truth or tenet or principle that we are spiritual beings first, having a human experience second. So there's the goal line, family, money, job, house, all those sort of experiences here. But there's also the soul line. And when we focus on the soul line, it's not uncommon that generally it takes care of the goal line. But as you know, and particularly perhaps in our society, and I do think that's changing because I think we're in a state of great awakening and revelation, and raising of consciousness. I was just talking about 
this with someone I just interviewed, how many yoga studios there are now compared to the 60s, thousands. There were none back in the 60s. So we are evolving and um, that's good news. So. And I take it that uh, from my observations of, let's see, I've known you now 12 years, maybe 13 years, something like that, at less than 15. So practically don't know you at all, right? <laughs> but in a short you're only time, our godson, you're only our godfather to our son who you share the same birthday, worth mentioning. <laughs> yes, it is, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am honored. And, uh, but uh, evolving, when we talked about this just a couple weeks ago, I believe that you're not the same person I met. You're not the same person I talked to five years ago. You're not right. the same person I went to your wedding. Right. You're, you're not the same person last year. Nope. And, and I think after our earlier conversation this morning, in some ways, you're not even the same person since that conversation before we began this interview. Yep. So it, it, it's it's an ongoing process. Now, how'd you get involved? I noticed that you you you've gotten your degrees and your studies in the, in the spiritual area now, and you're you're now a reverend. And uh, can you tell us about that experience? What what got you there? Uh, and and what do you? Uh, there's a guy that you're following now, or or has have you have a new mentor? Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about this guy. Um, well, I'll say first of all, I've had a lot of spiritual teachers and mentors along the path. Many. I had a shamanistic teacher who's a very well known teacher, Alberto, Alberto Velodo who um, taught me sh some things about shamanism. He teached me how to see um, an incredible human being. I had um, Buddhist teachers when I was in New York City who would take me up to Woodstock and we would meditate and learn. They would teach me Zen Buddhism. And it's like the universe, I'd go to a party and the universe, I'd walk into a party and I'd be like, eh, this isn't for me. But I would like slam right into this guy, nothing, just purely platonic. And he'd, he'd recognize something in me. I'd recognize something in him. And he'd say, hey, you want to go up to Woodstock tomorrow and go to a monastery? Now you would think, especially in this day and age, that's crazy. And what are you doing trusting basically a stranger? Yeah, not a very good pickup line, right? Not a good, but you know what? you develop, like I said earlier, it, it, you have a feeling of pe for people, right? And there was no um, alarm bell going off and I trusted him. And yeah, many people would say, well, that's not using your common sense. That's ridiculous, that's stupid. Okay, it worked out. <laughs> and he ended up being one of my greatest teachers. And, um, and same thing with running into a man in New York City who took me under his wing and taught me Reiki for free. And a lot of these teachers, all of these teachers, in fact, in my early years, they taught me for free. And that to me is seva, that's service. They don't want anything in return except to just serve and give and serve my upliftment. And I will be inherently grateful to them. But as I went deeper along the path, as you ask, we shared a spiritual teacher that I've moved on from and you know about. Um, and when I look for a spiritual teacher now, I really look at the people surrounding that teacher because they, to me, other people can disagree, to me, they are a direct reflection of the work. So if there is a lot of loving in the air, in this magnetic energy, right? I want more of that. That's where I'm going. That's what I'm interested in. So when I um, was studying and getting my master's in spiritual psychology, two of my teachers, Ron and Mary Holnick, are both PhDs in psychology. They had a spiritual teacher named John Roger 
who um, was a doctor of spiritual science. And he, in my opinion, was a very awake man. But mind you, he never said to call him a guru. He never said to follow him. And in fact, to his credit, he said, anything I say, please, I implore you to check it out. And if it doesn't work for you, great, don't use it. And the tenets of this work, particularly of my ministry, are three really important, um, they're tenets really, to live life that are directly from the words of John Roger. And it feeds the field of the loving. And the first thing is to love yourself. Love yourself so that you can love others, okay? The second tenant is take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. And the third tenant is to take everything that you experience in life and use it, good, bad, or indifferent, but of course, particularly the not so great stuff. Take it, use it for your growth, your learning and your upliftment. Because the, the physical reality exists for the sole purpose of soul transformation, for self-realization. So to me, that really sings to me. And that creates the raising of humanity, the upliftment of humanity. And every great spiritual teacher that has ever hit me in the heart where it counts, they came at me with pure, unadulterated love. And to me, that's who John Roger is and was. He passed some years ago, not fairly recently, maybe like five years ago. Um, What's interesting again, <laughs> but your audience will get this because they're um, privy to this sort of way of thinking, I think. I never met him and I never met him in the physical. And um, I wasn't really with a particular teacher at the time when I was in my spiritual psychology training. And Ron and Mary were very classy in a way that not only are they brilliant in what they do, but they didn't impose their spiritual teaching upon you. So I, it would just be off in the wings, like you know, some things we'd read, and we read 40, 50 books, would be on John Roger. So then I did my own exploration that was very organic. And as a, someone who I consider, I consider myself to be like the perpetual student. And um, the moment you stop uh, learning, there's, there's, um, there's, there's entropy. I'm interested in centropy. I'm interested in living in that state always of expansion, even if I don't like what's going on. So I'm really interested in just going as far as I can go and as high as I can high, and as high as I can go. And, and also taking that elevation, that wisdom that inherently comes from the work and integrating it. So it's not like having one foot up there and one foot down there and down here, which we know there, we see that. It's, I think we're more powerful when we take all that and we are in these bodies for a reason and we integrate it into our center, into our I amness, into our knowing, into our confidence in that knowing. So when I was in school, I um, became familiarized with John Roger and I started reading up on some of his works and it really spoke to me. And um, I got, got that hit just like we do, that intuitive hit from grace you could call that sweet small voice inside that said yeah go this way and i applied for the masters in spiritual science 
And to do that, you, um, I'm trying to think, did I have to, I think I had to be a discourse reader. He has these discourses just like many spiritual teachers do. There are these sacred teachings and uh, Paramahasa Yogananda had the discourses. Sri Teshwar, I believe, had discourses. A lot of teachers had disc have discourses. So he had his own discourses. And uh, I was driving in my car. I was applying for the program. This is an interesting story. And um, I, my computer crashed at the end of the application. And by the way, this isn't like some crazy application. It's not like I'm applying to Harvard, but it, it took me like a couple hours and I uh, was about to press send my computer crashes. And I go, ah, maybe that's a sign. Maybe I'm not meant to do this. And I get in my car and I'm, I'm just having this sort of ruminating in my head. Maybe I should look elsewhere. And I heard like, just as if he was sitting right next to me, he said, I'm gonna give you the keys. And I'm like, say what? <laughs> and I'm like, am I going crazy? I need feedback. I need to know that what I just heard is real and it's not my imagination because I have a big imagination. And that's how spirit works with me is that my experiences and people will say, God, I've never had that before. And I say, no, 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 you don't understand. That's how spirit works with me because my imagination is so big that it has to show up like that. So there's no way I can question or doubt it. So I'm in the car. He says, I'm gonna give you the keys. And the keys are things that we just learned. They're spiritual teachings, they're um, revelations, they're seeds of wisdom, they're blessings, they're all of it. And I said, I need to know that this is you and not my imagination. He said, okay, go ahead, ask. And I said, okay, like, okay, hotshot. I will ask, um, I wanna see keys written in front of me. And I'm at a red light and a car pulls up next to me and the license plate says keys. Keys on the license plate, Bill. And yet, and yet, in my humanness, I'm still like, wait a minute, that's not good enough. You need a better one. Still doubting, still questioning, can't capacitate what's going on. He said, oh, you doubt, do you? Go ahead, ask bigger. Oh, and I should say, uh, I should clarify this story. My first ask was I wanted to see keys and I had keys because I have a keyless car. My keys were in my lap and I thought that was too easy. So then he said, okay, go ahead, ask again. I said, I'd like to see keys, car pulls up. Then he said, oh, not good enough for you? Go ahead, ask bigger, like go for it, let's go. And I said, I wanna see your name written in front of me. Well, at this point, I'm feeling this pervasive energy. I'm feeling this thickness in the air and I'm recording myself talking on my voice recorder on my phone. And all this whole time I'm at a red light and I'm recording this conversation between my voice and the silent presence that I'm hearing ringing in my ear, like he's sitting right next to me. And he said, you want to see my name? You'll see my name the moment you stop looking for it, got it? And I said, got it. And he says, great, see you later. And he's like, if you watch some of his videos on YouTube, or, he's hilarious. The guy was all about humor. He was all about laughter. He was all about laughing and laughing at each other. Yes, laughing at each other because we take ourselves too seriously. And so, um, I pressed stop and I had to write down what this was. So I wrote down JR conversation, return, save. And he pops back in and he goes up, oh, there's my name, anything else? <laughs> and that's kind of how that started. 
So yeah, these are pretty wild, wacky stories. And uh, I just think that's just the nature of the supernatural. And um, it's now at this point in my life, it's my um, desire really to normalize the mystical because I believe like my stories are pretty cool, right? But I think people are having these experiences all day long and they just don't know it. Some know it, some are really open to it. Some are seeing things all day long and seeing angels and masters or light or whatever. But I think everyone, why, how am I more connected than anyone else really? So it's just that we, we get it to the degree perhaps of our receptivity, of our wanting. Life meets you at the level of your consciousness and spirit meets you at the level of your action. So perhaps, perhaps I'm having these experiences that are unique to me that match my particular action. It's like, you know, I know what I like on my pizza and it's not going to be what you like on your pizza. <laughs> so it's just going to look different for each person. And um, speaking of that, since you're now a mother. Yeah. And uh, obviously you're looking at your child's future. You're looking at your son's spiritual welfare. How much are you directly or indirectly in trying to influence that? Or are you really giving this child a menu of free choice? Or, or are you directed in any direction? Wonderful question. Well, I think the most powerful thing we have in life is not free will, it's free choice. I don't think we have free will because if you had free will, you could go like jump off a building and fly and you can't do that. We can't will ourselves to do everything we want to do, but we have choice and how we respond to life and the conditions of life. And to me, that's part of being, by the way, a spiritual warrior and cultivating self-mastery. And those tenets of my ministry, which are to me the tenets of life, is to use everything in your life, the way it's presented, the way it comes, the way you create it, being a responsible creator, to your growth and upliftment in service to your acceleration and transcendence. So I think that we have something very important called free choice. That said, yes, he's only 10, soon to be 11, of course. And um, as a parent, you want to guide them and shape, shape them um, in a way where they uh, are hopefully going to make the best choices in their life. But I also recognize that everybody has, as you know, their own path and their own karma. And um, I, it's really important to me that I let that um, aspect of um, development breathe. So I think there's, I, I can't remember, I think he was a child psychologist um, said, it's not what you do, it's not what you say, excuse me, it's they will do what you do, they won't do what you say. And so just through our behavior, we can um, positively influence um, our children. And so watching me meditate every day, somewhere that's going in and he, for him, that's very normal. He knows that mommy and daddy meditate sometimes together, sometimes separately every day in the morning, in the nighttime. And he doesn't disturb. He knows it's a sacred thing. And sometimes when he's stressed, he will instinctively, naturally choose to sit and meditate 
and see what he can um, willfully uh, create for himself by just sitting and, and um, choosing not to worry about that circumstance or that stressor, but to just be in, you know, I think of Ishvara Pranidhana, one of the aspects of the eight limbs, the eight limbed yogic path. Ishvara Pranidhana really means surrender. So I'm hoping to teach him, and it doesn't mean to surrender and even necessarily to the bad things, it's really surrendering to the presence so that you can be what I believe we inherently are, which are not just responsible creators, we are co-creators. So if you're really a co-creator, then you are creating in cooperation with spirit. And how spirit shows up for you is gonna be different dependent on your path. But whatever that is, it's greater than this limited human self or the basic self or the smaller self. It's you tapping into the larger self. It's you tapping into the authentic you. It's you tapping into the unconditionality of that nameless nothingness that's everything. So yeah, I don't, I don't impress, I don't, um, I don't push him in one way or the other. Um, but if I see that he's interested, I'm going to start feeding him information. So that, that will keep his interest, that will hopefully fuel that interest and um, create a good uh, foundation for his sense of um, self and shaping his character. And my path is really following the path of the loving. So it's like, if you can be in your loving, if you can live with awareness, love and awareness usually takes care of a lot in life. We tend to suffer when we're not in our loving, because we go into our judgment, we go into our separation, we go into our victimization, we go into our story. God, we love our story, right? But also we can really hurt ourselves. We can create in yoga, we call it ahimsa, which means violence. Uh, excuse me, ahimsa means nonviolence. Himsa is violence. So we want to be in that state of nonviolence to the self. And by the way, nonviolence doesn't have to, or I should say, violence in a yogic uh, approach. It doesn't just mean physical violence. It, the worst violence can be our part of my expression, but our shitty thoughts. Our, all those things we say about ourselves and have said that create that separation from that authentic nature that is really inherently who we are. So any teaching that I feel he kind of is interested in it's usually around a teaching of the loving. And if it comes from Paramahasa Yogananda, where he'll see our, our um, sort of triptych of the masters, the Nath master, Nath yogis from the Self-Realization Center, it's like on my puja is one of the things that just I refer to. And he'll ask and he'll say, who's that? Who's that? Who's Jesus? And then I'll give him my interpretation of Jesus based on my personal experiences of Jesus, not to say you need to believe this too, but at the end of the day, the most important thing is, that, is our direct experience. So if he is having an experience that's real for him, I wanna support that. You know, he, when he was a child, he saw a spirit and um, I didn't see it, I felt it and I heard it on my recording on my phone. And when he was like two, he was kind of tracking the, um, the, 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 the opening to the door in the kitchen. And he's just kind of tracking it. They call it apparently a friend of ours is a well-known medium and she calls it tracking. And it's something that you see children do. And um, he's tracking this spirit. And I'm feeling this presence, but I don't see anything. I don't hear anything, but I got um, 
a feeling that I should record this. So I got my cell phone, I stood on our dining room table chair and I start recording him. And I said, Avery, who are you talking to? After a few minutes went by, cause he's laughing. He is having a freaking blast. He's like, ah! <laughs> I mean, he, it, it, he's, he's, he's having a party. And then finally he turns around and runs to me and he said, Ryan. Well, when I played this recording back to a friend of mine, who's actually my hairdresser, I said, hey, check this out. This is pretty cool. I think my son's like seeing a spirit. And I felt it in the room. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. She would, listens to it and her face turns white and she's, her mouth is wide open. I'm like, are you okay? She said, did you hear that? And I said, hear what? The spirit that says, she said, who's this person that's whispering in the phone that says, Ryan? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I've listened to this like 10 times. I never heard it until I replayed it after she mentioned it. And you hear right before my son says, Ryan, you hear Ryan, clear as a bell. And I've showed that to, I don't know, maybe 50 people. And I showed it to our friend who's a very well-known medium. And that's her normal, seeing spirits, you know, to help people um, with their loved ones who've crossed over to give them hope. And she said it was one of the greatest pieces of evidence of how children are just over that edge of the veil on the side. They're, they're, play, they're, in, they're still kind of in both worlds. And her advice was, I thought, really great because she said, don't encourage it. And the reason you don't want to encourage it, you don't want to shut it down. You don't want to say, oh, that's crazy. You don't want to say that's not real. Just don't encourage it. And the reason you don't encourage it is because he's here now. He was there earlier. And it's important that he knows that this is where he's at now. And he may tap into these things, but it's important that he's grounded on this planet. He's incarnated for a reason. So um, to me, it's about bringing heaven to earth and living heaven on earth and not having that straddling of having one foot here and one foot there, which I had for many years, mind you, when I was sick and I thought I was leaving. It wasn't until I got into biofield tuning, which is one of the things I do now as a, um, I don't even like to call myself a healer, Bill, because it's such a loaded word and I'm not doing the healing. I'm a facilitator. I'm a facilitator. I'm a commutator. Um, I don't even know if I'm a channel. I might be a channel, but I'm a facilitator. You're the one that's doing the healing. And I don't ever want to be put on a pedestal and say, um, which I've experienced, you know, that you're, oh, you're my healer. I was in a supermarket one day. I was having a horrible day. And this woman was with her husband. She goes, oh, honey, 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 this is my guru. This is my guru. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, I am not. I'm not enlightened. <laughs> I'm a human being. And having experiences and problems and issues and challenges, just like you. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's really important to guide your children, to um, inspire them to um, seek the path of spirit, which is really the path of the loving, and not to impose your. Um, direct experiences upon them. But if they're curious, if they ask, then you share. And so I share, I share my experiences about Jesus, who to me is, um, he's one of the greatest avatars now. He was really an avatute um, who became an avatar um, that ever walked the planet. And um, to, in my, it is my belief, if you read Jesus of India and other texts and Eastern literature, he didn't even die on the cross. You know, they went to, in order, they say to die on the cross, it takes at least 48 hours. Well, they brought him down after six hours because they were, they were rushing before Sabbath. So they brought him down before 
um, before the sun went down on Friday night and brought him into the tomb. And if you believe it to be so, he, his disciples, of course, when you know, as the story goes biblically, they went there and the tomb was empty. Well, in the Eastern tradition, they talk about India, uh, they talk about Jesus as this, yes, he was a rabbi, but he was also an Essene, a very mystical um, sect of Judaism. And he was a, um, he was what they call Ishtanath. Well, Ishta or Isa, Isha, okay, Ishta, E-I-S-H-A, often how you see it, means the wise man. And Nath means, as you know, the great masters or the great ones or the great yogis or the great yogi sages. So he was this great wise yogi sage. And if you look at old um, texts from Asia, from all these different, from even pulling, I believe from the Dead Sea Scrolls, he traveled all over. He studied Buddhism, he studied Sufism, he had experiences in India and he traveled to India after that crucifixion and lived to the ripe old age of 120. And if you go to Kashmir, there is a tomb there that says here lies the tomb of Isa or Ishanath, which many believe is Jesus. So that's the Jesus I know, <laughs> which is very different than my upbringing. And I'm not even saying one is better than the other, by the way. It's just that to me, you can never take away a person's direct experience. And I don't really care if people believe that or not, or they get on board with that as their um, truth. I, I don't care. It's just happens to be what my truth is and my direct experience. And um, yeah. I think you, you know my Jesus story, which. Um, no, let's. I, I oh, do, no. But the, let's let's tell it. This is a good time to let's tell that before Zoom. Yeah. Um, well, again, I find that Jesus is um, filled with humor, and uh, as much as he is with the loving, and what happened for me in my late 20s, uh, no, actually it was, I was like 30. And what's so ast astonishing is that even as I tell this story, like many of these stories, I don't always remember. It's like, there are people that have these experiences and they were like, I remember the day, it was Friday night. I was lying in my bed, it was my birthday. I was about to, you know, and no, it's like this mirage. It's this, this um, sort of, a th it's this period in my life that I can't really lock in because at the time I kind of just washed over it and just kind of went about my way. And it wasn't until many years later and many experiences later that I started kind of put picking, uh, co connecting all the dots and um, just thinking more deeply upon the purpose and, the, and my path uh, and, and why these things were happening to me. So what I was a, probably about 30 and I was in a yoga class in Venice, California, nothing special, nice teacher playing the harmonium, singing some chant. And I'm lying in Shavasana as we do. Maybe it was five minutes. Maybe it was 10 minutes. Again, like you can relate to, you lose all sense of time because it is beyond space and time. And I have my eyes closed and all of a sudden I start to feel the bones in my sternum start to snap open, break, pop. And right before that happened, I heard the sound of what I consider it to be the sound of boulders, like a big boulder, like <sighs> moving in my right ear. So the sound of a boulder in my right ear. And um, I'm starting to feel the bones in my sternum break open. And my heart is completely exposed. Like I'm having open heart surgery. I know that feeling. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I know you do. 
And I, and people say, well, didn't it hurt feeling these bones break? And I said, I compare it to when I gave birth and I broke my tailbone, but I had an epidural at the time. So I felt this big break, which it was, I popped my tailbone, the bone out, but I had an epidural. So I didn't feel the pain, but I felt the break, which if that makes sense. And that's what it felt like. I felt the break, but it was like I had an epidural, so I didn't feel the pain. And my heart was fully exposed, like wide open. And I thought I was dying because I'm like, what is happening to me? And I wanted to scream, but something took over my, the control of my body. And it was like, I was paralyzed. This force was so beyond <laughs> anything. I, uh, it was so powerful that I couldn't even move my body. I couldn't even utter, oh, I, I couldn't even. <laughs> and I opened my eyes and the Jesus that I know of, how he appears to me is on the ceiling pouring thousands of rose petals into my heart. And just like many people talk about when they cross over people that have NDEs, your experiences, Bill, it's love um, amplified a million times and then some. And so when people say, what's the greatest love you've ever felt? Well, in my humanness, of course, it's the birth of my son. It's my child. It's like I live for him, right? Um, but this is like even beyond that greatest love. It's beyond. I cannot capacitate the love that I, I, it's, it's uncontainable. And that's what I felt. And it lasted maybe a minute or two, I'm guessing. And then something just, I had no control over my body. And then something just closed my eyes and closed my heart. And then the man came back, the teacher came back and said, okay, everybody started. <laughs> and I went about my day. And what's wild is I didn't really change my life after that experience. It wasn't like, oh, maybe I should be a born again Christian, or maybe I should go to church more, or uh, maybe I need to clean up some part of my life or rethink this or rethink that. Like, no, I just was like, okay, that happened. I don't really know what to make of it. Um, and it wasn't until like 10 years later when I went back to school and we're in hundreds of pound, hundreds of triads of, um, uh, client, um, facilitator, a neutral observer, and you start talking and you start processing and you start sharing. And this story just inevitably kind of came out from the depths and I never shared it with anybody for the same reason that 99.9% .9 of the people that don't share it with people is because they don't want to feel like people are going to think they're crazy. Our society, you know, I think it's getting better and better. As we say, I want to normalize our mystical experiences. So I kept it to myself until about 10 years later and I'm in school and I'm in these triads and people would say, that's a really powerful story and experience. And I'd be like, oh, is it? Yeah. I, he's like, and they'd say, well, I didn't have that experience. And I just started seeing, I started opening my eyes, I think, to the grace. And the grace that's just showed up the way it shows up for me. Not like, oh, look at all the grace in my life, Bill. I have so much more grace than Pamela over here who's not had this Jesus experience. No, it's just recognizing my own grace. Like, wow. Like it has to look like that for me so that I can wake up to the magnificence of my life. I had a miscarriage when I was 40. I really wanted this baby. 
And I was trying to decide whether to call her Avalon or Grace. And I had a dream right before I miscarried. And I thought it was just like my hormones. And she said, mom, don't call me Avalon, call me Grace, call me Grace. But listen, I can't stay, I have to go back. I'm gonna be much more effective. And she said, I'm gonna be more of use up there. And I'll be working with you up there than down here. In my body, I'll be limited because maybe something was wrong with her DNA or the way if she came out in this lifetime, maybe it wasn't part of her um, contract to do that, to only go so far, which I believe is true with spirit and souls. So I had this dream and I woke up and sure enough, I went and shortly thereafter, um, had a miscarriage. And um, I'm so grateful for that experience. I'm obviously not grateful for losing a pregnancy, but I recognize her part in it and her contract with me in it, where that was her choice. And I was a participant in that contract. And in that experience, and during that time, I was kind of feeling like, I guess my life matters. I mean, if I die today, I guess some people will miss me. I mean, maybe I'm loved. I think I'm loved. I mean, in my humanness, again, I had doubt ruminating in my mind. I matter, I don't matter, what I do matters, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know? And in my, um, when I had that experience, it was so profound in a spiritual way for me because I truly believe she, I had to lose a life so that I could recognize the magnificence of my own. Like it had to go that far for me so that I could recognize like, why would I ever want to consider, and, I, I, and I'm not talking about suicide. I've never been any of that. I've never had depression and, and it's okay if people are, I don't want to put a stigma on any of that. That's not where, what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is in my questioning of the, um, the sanctity, the sacredness of my own life in my own incarnation of my own being here and devaluing myself like every birth is a gift and why am i not seeing myself as part of that gift just like it's like yeah like when they say and i'm no biblical scholar believe me but it's like when they say no soul is forsaken like no soul is forsaken like spirit, God, the universe, divinity, Christ, Buddha, whatever you want to call it. It's not like, yeah, like everybody, you get, you get to be going here in the light. You get to be held in the light. You get to be guided. You get to be loved. But we're going to leave Diane and Pamela out over here. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. God is either unconditionally loving or he's not. And I choose that it's the former. He is this unconditional she, it. They are this unconditional presence and it's our opportunity to recognize the magnificence of that presence as part of who we are, as part of our makeup. So even in a miscarriage, there was tremendous opportunity for healing myself and, and stepping even deeper, more deeply into the, um, the grace of my life. It is no mistake that she wanted me to call her grace because that was grace in motion. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. I've shared a lot of stories here that I've never shared. So oh, it's very cathartic. <laughs> I should be charging you for this, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, what do I owe you? <laughs> I'll send you a check. All right. That's, uh... As we end this, because you know we could we could go me and you talking we could go on for days. Right. But 
what one piece of advice, if, if there is one piece, maybe it's pieces, would you give seekers out there? And I mean, seekers mean everybody's a seeker. They, some don't realize they're a seeker and some do. But what have you learned that you think is worthy of passing on? I mean, what is it? What, what's, what's, what's your secret to, to, to this whole thing? Why are we here? What, what's the purpose? Well, I think we're here to remember who we really are. And we all in varying degrees have spiritual amnesia. And we're here to work through the illusions of ourselves, of our perceptions, of our limited perceptions of ourselves, of others, and of life. So there's so much joy here and there's a lot of intensity, but I choose to believe that we all chose to come down here. We chose to come down here. You know, as a mother and as a mother who has both a child here on the earth and a mother who I consider, I have one child on the earth and one kind of tinkerbelling around in spirit. <laughs> I learned through my experience how few pregnancies actually make it. Like just for a baby to be born is a miracle. 50% of pregnancies or more end in miscarriage. So I'm interested in um, stepping into the the an awakening to the grace that is this life. And I think the best advice, there are no mistakes. At the end of the day, from a more elevated perspective, no matter what's going on, no matter how nefarious um, the conditions are, because there is nefarious, nefarious creatures, beings. There's, if you want to call it bad stuff, evil that is present. And I think it's there for, for on purpose so that we can work with it and we can rise and transcend and elevate above it. And so that we can really come into the experience of who we are beyond all the conditions that are here. We can live heaven on earth. So there are no mistakes. And in recognizing there's no mistakes, then what is there? There's opportunities for growth. And I am now in my life choosing through my free choice to look at everything that has happened to me as an opportunity. And I wouldn't have asked my life to be any different. I wouldn't wish violence, of course, upon anyone, but um, it's all been, they've all been um, necessary for whatever reason, beyond my understanding, vehicles for my own inner transformation so that I can start refining the inner landscape of my life and I can raise my consciousness and I can really more than ever step into my self-love because I think that's the epidemic, Bill. I think the epidemic is the lack um, of self-love and not allowing ourselves to feel whatever it is we need to feel. You know, in biofield tuning, we don't judge any emotion because we recognize that every emotion is necessary at that time. It's like anger, when you're angry, that's, that's feedback to you that there is a boundary violation somewhere. And yet we can grow up with our parents or our environment that can tell us, you're not supposed to feel that. You're not supposed to say that. Who are you to think that? And we start stuffing and stuffing and stuffing and covering and covering and 
we, we slowly stop expressing the fullness of this, all the colors of our expression, which part of that is anger. You can be angry in a very heart-centered and healthy way. You know, you can be angry in a very violent way, but as a, as one who chooses to walk the spiritual path, the path of the spiritual warrior is to live in my world with the tenets of self-love, to love thyself so that you can love others. A lot of people may love others, but there's not a lot of people loving themselves. There's some people that really are great caretakers, but they aren't taking care of themselves, right? And there's a lot of people that are taking their life experience and just because of where they're at now, they're making themselves the victim and they're judging and they're blaming and they're pointing the finger instead of really finding ways to heal and finding ways to use whatever it is that happened to them. Um, again, I'm not inviting it, but I'm saying if these, if suffering is inevitable, then why not try to find a way to heal the suffering so that we can suffer less and we can dissolve the separatism, particularly the separatism between the divine and this thing we call the spacesuit we call the body or our identity, which is just really a container for who we truly are. So I think it's um, really living uh, in line with, with our loving. Because if you're happy, you can't block another person's happiness. You just can't. Just the, the love flows, the humor sis, sits, the joy naturally just flows. You wanna be around those people and then it spreads because that's how energy works. So, you know, I was saying in biofield tuning, you know, we never judge any emotion because they're all necessary. But I also recognize after walking through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people's fields, which we could talk about another time, I recognize that where our suffering lies is not allowing ourselves to express what needed to be expressed at that moment in time. So it's like not what happens to us, it's what we decide about ourselves in those moments with those events that really shape us. And so we get to, we get to in this lifetime reframe and become the designers, the co-creators with our life. And that's what I'm doing. I'm choosing to be a, um, a reframer of my life, not a denier, but to see the good, to see the opportunity, to see the grace and not just be the light bill. That's one thing, that's great not just be the love, that's great. It's being in action. Being the loving is very different than just love. It's the action of being the loving. It's the action of not just being the light, but also working with the light, being in action. And that's our 10%. And then the spirit will meet us at the level of our action, of our doing. Does that help. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I talk a lot. Yeah. I'm sure I some, apologize. Psych some psychologists would have fun with me because while you're talking about anger, I can't remember a moment. That's what, that's one, one emotion I, I've never gone down. So some psychiatrists have fun with that. Uh, I mean, I've been hurt, you know, hurt, disappointed, things like other emotions. Uh, I can, I can say I've never been angry. So something's got to be wrong with me. Somebody will have fun with that. They'll watch this video and say, boy, you really are. I don't think I'm suppressing it. It's not suppression. I'm not suppressing anything. I just, I'm just very forgiving of everything. 
and even if somebody you know momentarily does something to me i i realize it's an ignorance if they really knew who i was or what i was trying to do for them they would think different and then i think how terrible they must be to do something to me you know it's just i never put it on uh, on another level other than i forgive them i love them i mean i'm sorry they feel that way but i can't get to that emotional level not even in vietnam i don't i never hated anybody mm -hmm. and guys trying to kill me like i just go well you know we're on different sides different team anyway blessings and peace to you reverend and uh blessings and peace to you bill reverend bill and uh Godfather of Godfathers. Uh, the Godfather, God, yeah, that's my greatest title. And happy right. early birthday. Yeah, yeah, well, it's coming up, right? We're doing this on what, the 14th? Tomorrow's the Ides of March. And then follows that with the great 16th of March, my birthday, which uh, is celebrated internationally, intergalactically around the worlds. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this planetary hologram and beyond. Oh, who are you kidding? All right. That's but, part uh, two. Anyway, I'll be interested to watch this back because while I'm watching you, somebody will watch towards, not the very end, but about 30 minutes ago, you were talking about something and there was this up on your ceiling above that gather sign and going up your ceiling, there was a little dot of light. I don't know if it was reflection off something. So you have to look there to see if something was reflecting, but it was kind of like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. And, then it, and then when I noticed it and I started watching it, it just disappeared like, you're not, you're not watching this. It just went. So anyway, so I don't know if I'm the only one that saw that. I'll but check it out. I we'll have to check it out. All right. They, we, we get we visitors. Will, <laughs> we will talk later. We're going to end this recording now. And the people that want to get a hold of you, why don't you give me your your uh, website, a, any information for contact, uh, email, yeah. whatever. So my website is Alchemy, as it's spelled A L C H E M Y, Alchemy of Mastery.com. And I'm doing a podcast as well, um, which has been, you have been a gracious and incredible guest, of course. And um, it's called the Spiritual Geek Out Podcast. And you can find that on all the usual suspects um, iTunes, Apple, uh, Spotify iHeart, Amazon, you name it. And, um, and if you go to my website, you'll find out uh, more about my work. And you can also listen to the podcast there. And if you have any questions along the path, I'd love to hear from you and just give you my uh, loving service, because at the end of the day, that's what brings me joy. Well, so, well, yeah. Thank you. And I, ho I hope that you'll send me some stuff I can make a little bit more. I, I, I give really I take advantage of my friends. I figure I know who they are. Everybody must know who they are. Uh, but people are interested in your little short bio. So you send me something, we'll put a little short bio at the, into the, uh, uh, the comments and stuff above the, you know, below this uh, video. For so sure. Blessings and peace to you. We will talk right after we uh, stop recording here. But Much love, Bill. Love you. Thank you and, and bless you. Bless you.